Today we're going to continue talking about structures and we're going to get into a different kind of structure uh, today that, that is different than what we've done so far. What you've seen so far are called trusses. And uh, who remembers what the big deal was about trusses? What, what is it that makes a truss? Right? It's, someone says two force members. It is a structure made entirely of two force members. So our definition of something that is a frame, uh, not surprisingly, is a structure that contains at least one member that is more than a two force member. Right? It actually will carry uh, other loads besides just say, a tension or compression, compressive load applied to the ends of, uh, of, say, a long slender member, that kind of thing. Okay? So that's the definition that I've got up here. You might see those are two different structures that I've got uh, shown up there. The one on the left is a truss, right? All of the members that compose that structure uh, are two force members. So this is a truss. Okay? Over on the right... That's a kind of similar looking, in some ways, structure, right? But what you'll notice is I tried to be very careful to show member, particularly member ABC, what's different about that member? All right. It connects from A to B to C, right? And it's, it looks like it's all one piece. I heard someone use the word rigid, right? And I like that. That is a member that I'm going to consider as a piece that will not change shape easily. It won't change length, and it won't change the, uh, the angle, say, uh, you know, maybe right at B where you might think it, it should, or you might, uh, if you're thinking of it as a truss, you might think, well, you know, it might pivot there at B. No, it won't, right, because it looks like it's one solid piece that goes up through B and on to C, right? Uh, because of that, one of the ways of thinking of member ABC is that portion AB of the member can transmit a moment to portion BC, right? It can transmit a rotational influence across that pin at B, and so it's not going to behave like a truss would, right? So that, um, that's what makes this a, uh, a frame instead of a truss, okay? Do you see anything else that makes this a frame rather than a truss? Okay, someone says, I think, the force applied to point E, right? You might remember when we looked at trusses, one of the rules we made that would make something a truss or, or, or not, right, is that you could not have a load applied anywhere else besides joints. Remember when we said that when we were defining trusses? Okay, well, notice for this frame, I now have a load that's applied somewhere else besides a joint, right? So that's, that makes that... Uh, member right there, GED, that makes that member uh, more than a two-force member, okay? So what happens if I do this? What if I erase that thing? Is What is member GED now? It's become a two-force member again, and the only difference was that I considered that uh, externally applied load or not. Right, so just the presence or the absence of an externally applied load can change a member from a two-force member to more than a two-force member. Okay, does that make sense? All right, so those are a couple of examples like that. Um, and uh, another question that comes up, uh, usually following right on the heels of this one, because we typically label these, these lectures frames and machines, right? A lot of folks then want to know, well, what's the difference between a frame and a machine? Okay? And this one's a lot harder for me to talk about because functionally there isn't much of a difference between a frame and a machine. Okay? The difference between frames and machines has more to do with usage rather than to do with how you go about analyzing them. Right? So that's why uh, I'd make a, a smaller deal of a difference between frames and machines but I will talk about it here anyway, at least briefly. Notice here the, uh, the object there on the left, okay? Does that object on the left have any two force members as a part of it? Okay, which 
I haven't put letters on it, I guess maybe, let me add some letters. Say this is point A, that's point B, and that's point C. What's a two-force member in that? Okay, member BC is a two-force member. How do you know? Okay, it's got one pin on each end. It's basically connected at exactly two locations with frictionless pins. No external loads applied anywhere else to it. So member BC is a two-force member. That doesn't make this a truss because you might notice member AC and member AB, those have, uh, they are connected at two locations, but then they have an external load applied somewhere else besides at a joint, right? So those two members, AB and AC, are more than two force members, and so it means that this is a frame, all right? And no one would really argue with me, I don't think, on that point. But I want you to look at that compared to the uh, case that I have on the right, okay? Do members A, B, and A, C really behave any differently between one case and the other, okay? They don't. Some people are saying no. Why not? Okay. Let's say this is like a, a disc or something over here, just so we can call it something. Okay. That disc that's being pinched by, you know, something that I intended to look kind of like the jaws of a pair of pliers or something, right? The disc that's being pinched by those jaws is experiencing the same kind of force that the link, this over here is what I would call a link between B and C. It's experiencing the same kind of force as the link. It's just something that you may not have, you know, thought of as a member before looking at this structure, right? So that's really kind of, to me, the big difference between frames and machines is that with a frame, all of the elements that compose it kind of look like they're supposed to be thought of as members, right? Whereas if you're talking about machines, then a lot of times you have at least one element of the structure that isn't doesn't really look like it's part of the structure. It looks like it's something else that the structure, structure is acting on. And yet, that disk will behave just like the link in terms of carrying load in the rest of this structure, okay? So that, to me, is the big difference between what I have on the left, which is a frame, and over here on the right, which is a machine, okay? Um, I will uh, make one other comment here as well. A lot of times the purpose of having a machine is to multiply force in some way, right? Or to create some kind of a motion of some kind, right? So, but in this class, because we're talking about a statics class, we can generally think of a machine as something that the main job of it is to, you know, either multiply or divide force, right? So you can imagine here that if I was to change certain dimensions, like let's say I had changed uh, the relative dimensions from where the force is being applied to the pivot point or from where the pivot point is to where the disk is, you can imagine that just by changing the location of that pivot point, I can create more or less force applied to the disk with the same amount of force applied out on the handles, for lack of a better term, of this uh, kind of pliers looking structure. Does that make sense? So that's a lot of times the purpose of a machine is to amplify force, okay? But like I said, there really isn't very much difference between analyzing a frame problem and a machine problem. About the only difference is sometimes for a machine problem, you have to do the work of, of identifying something that may not look at, like it's a member in the frame. You might have to identify it still as being functionally a member. Right, just like in this case, I've got that disc that's being pinched. That's kind of acting like a member, even though it doesn't look like one. Okay, we good so far? Cool, now, I, uh, I strongly considered when I put together this lecture, I strongly considered flipping through a bunch of examples of ways that uh, different parts connect to each other and how you should go about doing free body diagrams for each of those ways that things can connect or interface with one another. I uh, decided not to do that because I think it might be more powerful to present that by showing you several example problems where I'm gonna try to cover a fairly large 
swath of different possibilities for how things can end up interfacing with each other, and we'll talk about them as we come to them. Okay, and we'll do it that way as opposed to just covering a, a big long list. Having said that, uh, many of you have the textbook that uh, we identified as being the text for this class, and if you do, and you would like a list that kind of works like that, um, I would direct you to Table 6.1. Uh, if you have the second edition of this text, uh, it is on page 239. But anyway, it goes through a bunch of different mechanical connections and gives you a little bit of a hint for each of those mechanical connections, how should you treat that connection on a free body diagram but we'll just do them as we come to them in our example problems, if that's all right with you guys. Sound good? Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is give you a couple of things, right? First, I'm gonna show you our first example. Actually, that's what's down below right there. And while you're sort of absorbing what we're gonna try to do with that example, what I'd like to do is talk through the general steps that we should go through to try to solve a uh, frame problem, okay? And here they are. Um, similar to what we did for trusses, one of the things you often have to determine is whether or not it's helpful for you to try to find external reactions first, okay? Something that is gonna get just a little more tricky though is there will be some cases that we will encounter where you will not be able to find the external reactions first you will find the external reactions in those cases as a result of analyzing each of the members individually, okay? And uh, what I'll say about this is that we're gonna focus in this class on two-dimensional problems. We'll try to master that first before we you know, expand that out. And I think we've already talked in here that in order to uh, fully locate a rigid body, Okay, rigid meaning not capable of changing shape in any way, right? In order to fully locate a rigid body in two dimensions, you need how many reactions? How many components of reaction to fully locate a rigid body in two dimensions? Okay, so there are two translations you have to take, take into consideration, right? You have to... Uh, have reactions that would keep the thing located up and down and left and right, okay? So there's, in 2D, there's those two translational, uh, you know, sort of fixtures that you would need to have to keep it from moving up or down or left or right. Is that enough for a rigid body in 2D or not? Okay, what else is a possibility if you have a rigid body in 2D? the thing could also rotate, right? And so the way this comes down to our equilibrium equations, if we're talking about rigid bodies in 2D, there are three equilibrium equations that we typically have to write for those rigid bodies in two dimensions. The reason there are three is that there are basically three degrees of freedom for a rigid body in 2D, right? That means it can translate in two directions and rotate about one axis and that is, it's basically how much it can move or the types of ways it can move, okay? Well, that's a little bit of a clue to us that if we encounter a, uh, a structure that has three components of external reaction, okay? So let me put this over here. Three components of external reaction. then that's a clue to you that you can probably find your external reactions first. And that makes your problem a lot simpler. The other thing you will notice, uh, you know, basically uh, as part of this number one, the other thing you will notice if you can find your external reactions first, usually what you will see is that the body is what I call self-rigid, okay? So I'll put that as one bullet point. What do you think I mean by self-rigid? It holds itself together, okay? But it holds itself together in a unique way. It cannot move. Even if you pulled it off of the supports, it would not be able to move, at least not under the kind of load that we're applying, okay? So 
those are a couple of clues that you can use to know whether or not you can find your external reactions first. If both of these are true, then you can probably find your external reactions first. Okay? Whereas if you have more than three components of external reaction, or it looks like the body would be floppy, for lack of a better term, if you took it off the supports, then that's a usually an indicator that you should not try to find your external reactions first. Okay? You following me there? Okay, once you have determined whether or not you need to do your external reactions first, next you need to identify your members carrying more than two forces. And I'll tell you what, what I think is the easiest way to do that is actually to kind of go in reverse and identify all your two force members first. Okay? So anything that's not a two force member. So maybe I'll put that right here. Anything not two force. Okay. And here's why you need to do that. Whenever you're getting ready to draw free body diagrams of your uh, frame structures, we are not going to draw free body diagrams of the two force members. We are going to focus our efforts on free body diagrams of the members that are more than two force members, right? The ones that, are, that will carry more than just two forces. Okay, so that's where we're going to identify those. Uh, step three, we're going to draw what I use right there. I use this uh, term consistent free body diagrams of necessary greater than two force members, things that are carrying more than two forces. What do you think I mean by a consistent free body diagrams? Okay. One of the things we're going to have here is free body diagrams that are you know, part of the same structure. They're coming from the same structure, but we're separating them, right? So we're going to take members apart from each other. When we do that, should Newton's third law hold? Okay, and Newton's third law says what? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, okay? How do we represent that on free body diagrams? All right. If I show a force arrow acting on one body that goes a particular direction, what does that mean as far as the force arrow is concerned on the other body? Okay. You draw it along the same line, but you draw it with the arrowhead going the other direction. And that is a consistent, that's drawing your free body diagrams consistently with one another according to Newton's third law. Okay. So I'm going to make, just make that little comment right down here. Uh, Newton's third law. Okay. And then lastly, we have to write equilibrium equations and solve, I like to say, efficiently for what you need. Try to keep in mind what it is you're trying to find. And sometimes that will inform you as to which equations are really important for you to write and solve in order to get a quick solution for what it is that you're trying to find. And that is not always easy, but the good news is, even if you don't do it perfectly efficiently, um, you will get better by the practice, right, of doing them less efficiently than perfectly efficiently. But I'm gonna show you how I think about them. Uh, I can't give you necessarily one size fits all rules that you should always follow, but I'm gonna show you several uh, example problems over this lecture and the next one to try to give you some help in uh, identifying how you can go about doing these things more efficiently, okay, so that they're not as scary. All right, so those are the steps, and here's our example. We're supposed to find the force carried by pin B, by link CG, and by rope DE. That's our instructions for this little uh, structure that I've got right here. Now, hopefully it makes sense to everybody, but I basically have one member that extends from A up to B, over to C and to D. So that's all one member, okay? Going from A to B to C to D. Okay, then I've got another member um, that is going from E to G to B from that support at E, okay? In addition to those, I've also got member CG and member DE, okay? Now let's think about our steps. 
The first step I put up there is try to determine if external reactions should be found first. Okay, and I gave you a little bit of a discussion as to how you can know that. Right? So let's actually look at this diagram and try to determine how many external reactions do I have for this diagram. Okay, let's, first of all, let's look at where it has any external reactions, right? Pin E has some external reactions. Do you agree with that? And pin A interfaces with an external support, right? Which I should go ahead and mention here, I think I've said it before, but anytime you see one of these sort of hashed lines, right, with the hashes underneath it, what does that mean? Okay, that means that that surface is fixed. We're not going to ask questions about how. We're just going to say, let's assume that that can't move, right? That's what the little hash marks mean. So those are external reactions that happen on wherever we see those hash marks, right? Um, and we've got some at E and some at A, okay? So that, uh, you know, the interface that happens at E, okay, how does that work? What kind of a reaction is that relative to the, uh, to the support? Would it, would it be one component? Okay, two components. How do we know that? Okay, it's a pin that is resisting motion both horizontally and vertically. So there must be forces that are actually sitting there resisting motion both horizontally and vertically. So that's what we have at E. What about at A? Okay, so he says only vertically, which isn't quite true, okay, but I see where he's coming from. What should we say that's more true than that? It's going to be normal to the surface that that roller rolls against, which if the surface was horizontal, then yes, we would have a vertical component of reaction. But I threw a little bit of a curve at you and put that at a little bit of a slope here. Okay, so let's, um, let me ask this actually before I go on and draw the free body diagram of the whole thing to find external reactions first. Because in case you hadn't noticed, we basically have three components of reaction. Okay, and it might be harder for you to see, but in the direction that this body is being loaded, it is self-rigid. In other words, it will take on a particular shape and does not need the external reactions to hold that shape. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, before I get ready to draw the free body diagram, I'm going to take a, just a slight detour and ask you this question. If I was to change the reaction here at point A from a uh, formal roller that rolls at that point A, and instead I changed it to something more like this, And I told you that that end of that rod was frictionless. It had frictionless sliding against that surface. So maybe I would even add a little note that said here, frictionless. Let me ask you, have I changed anything? OK, why not? OK. Because either way, whether it be the roller that I had before or now this frictionless sliding surface, the line of action is going to be normal to this surface either way. Right? 90 degrees to that surface as long as that's a frictionless surface um, or if I had the roller rolling against the surface there. So now I've sort of covered two different possibilities that you can have that essentially act like uh, one component of reaction. Okay, um, no more messing around. Let's go ahead and draw a free body diagram to find our external reactions first. Sound good? Now, let me, let me uh, point this out. When you're doing this step of finding your, your external reactions, you don't have to be very formal about defining how all of the connections internally inside the body work together, okay? The pertinent pieces of information are where are all of your forces being applied and in what direction, right? So I could draw something as simple as just showing uh, maybe a, 
you know, a line up like this, a line over like this. I'll show another line down like this, and uh, maybe a, a line up here like this. Okay. And, uh, you know, if you want, you can show some of the other members there too. Okay. None of it matters what's inside of that structure while we're doing our free body diagram to find external reactions. We haven't taken it apart yet, so we're going to assume it's all internally self-rigid and we don't necessarily care um, how exactly the forces end up transmitted from externally where they're applied to uh, the other external locations. All right, so this is going to be a six kilonewton force right here. Now what else should I apply? Okay, I'm going to show a reaction force over here that I will call REX. What else? Okay, let me show one going down like this, and I'll call that uh, REY. Okay, and then I've got another force here at A. that I don't know, you know, what the value is, so I'll name it something. I'll just call that, you know, how about just RA? Okay. What else should I put on here? Okay, I should put what's that direction of RA, and I can put that in as an angle. If I show it right here, right, what should that value be? 15 degrees. How do I know that? And why did I draw it right there? Okay. If I'm elevated by 15 degrees horizontally, that means I've moved 15 degrees off of the vertical reaction because my actual line of action is 90 degrees to the surface that it's rolling against. Okay. So good for those of you who, who see that. All right. Good so far. What else should I add to this diagram? Okay, I need some pertinent dimensions, right? What are the dimensions that really matter to me here? Okay. What am I going to do with the diagram, would you think? Right. What, I'm drawing the free body diagram to be able to write what? Equilibrium, Equilibrium equations. And what's the most useful equilibrium equation you could imagine that I might need to write? Okay, moments. Probably a lot of times you do moments first because there might be too many unknowns if you don't do that, or there might be more, more unknowns if you don't do that, right? So if we're going to do moments first, where do you think we're going to sum moments around? E. And so what I want to do here is show my dimensions relative to E for anything that matters, and it turns out the only other place where anything would matter would be A, right? So really, the only two dimensions I really need are how far is it vertically from A up to E, and it says over here that that was two meters, right? And what else? Okay. Also, the horizontal distance from point A to point E, and how far is that? Four meters. So I guess I'll, just in the interest of trying to be uh, compact with my notation here, let me put that right here. That's four meters. Okay? Now, once I've got that free body diagram, and we already said a second ago what we wanted to do with it, right? We're going to sum moments around E. Tell you what, let me also put some coordinates on here so that I try to be complete. Okay? Let's go ahead and do that step of finding the... Uh, the reaction at A, right, by, by doing moments around E. Okay, what would that look like? Sum of moments around E equals zero. What uh, forces create moments around E? Okay, six kilonewtons, is that a clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise, right? So I'm going to put that in as a uh, positive six kilonewtons times what? Two meters. Okay. Then what? 
Okay? We could add a vertical component of RA, add or subtract, whichever would be appropriate, right? Okay? So people are saying here subtract, and I, t I typically agree with that. The vertical component of RA would create a clockwise tendency to rotate around E, so I'm going to count it as negative. How do I get just the vertical component? Multiply by the cosine of 15 degrees. And then to get, make it a moment, I need to multiply by the distance from that vertical component to location E, and that is 4 meters. Okay. And then um, what about the horizontal component of RA? Okay. It's also going to cause a clockwise tendency to rotate, so I'm going to subtract that one as well. If I multiply by the sine of 15 degrees, that gives me just the horizontal component, and I need to multiply that by 2 meters to figure out the moment that happens around location E. And then I think that's everything that I have that would create moments around location E. And so um, we can then solve for RA. Okay. <coughs> And I a lot of times find it easiest when I'm about to do this in the calculator to go ahead and just enter the equation just as it is. So like 6 times 2 minus, instead of RA, I'm going to put in variable x times the cosine of 15 times 4 meters, right, minus x times the sine of 15 degrees times 2 meters. Okay, and then I'm going to make it an equation by on, right here on the alpha key, right? And you might see above the calc key it has the equal sign. That's what gets me that equal sign. Set that equal to zero. Once I've got that equation put in, if I hit the shift key, it'll let me get this solve function above that calc key. I've already got a value stored into x just from previous whatever I've been doing. That doesn't matter. Um, I, I really don't uh, have a strong reason why I need anything in particular as my initial guess for x, so I'm just going to accept this, and it'll tell me here that my reaction I have there is going to be 2.739, uh, we'll say. 2.739, okay. Units? Kilonewtons. All right. Good work so far. What's next? Okay. The next ones, we should maybe find these reactions in the X and Y at E. Okay. So I'll just start in the X direction. Okay. I've got minus REX plus 6 kilonewtons minus RA, which I'll go ahead and plug that in, 2.739 kilonewtons, but not all of that, right? I need to multiply it by the sine of 15 degrees in order to get the horizontal component, okay? So I set that equal to zero, then what? Solve it, right? So I'm just going to end up with 6 minus, you may or may not know this, but my previous calculation stored the result into x, right? So I can actually use that if I want and put in x, right, times the sine of 15, okay, which gives me 5.291. kilonewtons. And because I say this a lot, I'll say it again now, the fact that that came out positive, what does it tell me? It tells me my assumption was correct. What direction was my assumption? Leftward, right? So the positive doesn't mean it's pointing rightward per se, it just means that my assumption that I made on my free body diagram was correct. 
And this is one of the reasons why it's so important to do free body diagrams, because they give you uh, the context that you can take your answers and know what they mean. Does that make sense? Okay, so there is that part, and then we'll do the y direction. Okay, in the y direction, I will have just the y component of, of RA. To get that, I'll take RA. Uh, again, let me plug in what I found for that earlier, 2.739 kilonewtons. I want to take it that times the cosine of 15 degrees to get just the vertical component, right? Minus REY, and that should be equal to zero, and it tells me that REY just ends up being, okay, uh, what I have stored into X times the cosine of 15 degrees. So that gives me 2.646, uh, we'll say. Okay, so that shouldn't have been new. Everyone's comfortable with that, right? Matter of fact, everyone's probably bored. But it's necessary to start with that so that we can get into the next part which is going to be a little bit new. So let me copy these answers up here. We'll say this is going to be 2.739 kilonewtons. This uh, REY is going to be equal to 2.646 kilonewtons. And REX uh, is going to be equal to Five point two nine one kilonewtons, and I'll take all this and get it out of the way. All right. So now that we have external reactions, what's next? Shall we go up to our list? What's next? Okay, identify members carrying more than two forces, right? And then I mentioned one of the easiest ways to do that is to find your two force members, and it's not those, right? So where are my two force members? Okay, CG has exactly two locations where it's connected by frictionless pins. So yes, CG is a two force member, and DE is a two force member because ropes are basically always two force members. Okay? So those are not members that I want to do part three, you know, for. We want to do part three for the ones that are carrying more than two forces. So that leaves me with members A, B, C, D and member B, G, E. Right? So let me draw those two free body diagrams. And we'll start looking to see all the forces that act on those two free, two free body diagrams and see what it takes to, um, you know, what it might take to be able to solve. Okay? So over here on the left, I guess I'm going to start with, and by the way, I, you know, it it's, is okay to simplify these. So I'm going to simplify A, B, C, D with just a line. And what forces act on that line? Okay. Yeah, the easy ones are down here, right? We already knew that we have six kilonewtons acting down here. We also know that we've got this RA acting in this direction, and that values 2.739 kilonewtons. at 15 degrees. Okay, good. Those were the easy ones, right? Then what? Okay. So 
Someone suggested R-E-Y. I'm going to say that might not be a good idea to put on this diagram. Why not? Yeah, R-E-Y and R-E-X are not applied to that member. We've got, we got to look at the forces that are just applied to that member. So what are some other ones that we would think about putting on uh, member A, B, C, D? Okay. I think I heard someone say D, E, right? So let me call that T, D, E. It's a two-force member. I can assume tension by showing the force uh, pointed toward the other end of itself, right? That, that means it's, we're assuming tension. Could I do the same at joint C? Okay. I could say here this would be T, C, G. Okay, so those are also not that tricky to draw on there. Now we get to the trickiest one for this member, and that it is at joint B, because that's not something I don't think we've done in here yet, All right? We can call that a slot. That's usually what we'll refer to it as. So we've got a pin and a slot. And based on what it looks like, what does it look like the pin is allowed to do? Okay. It looks like it's allowed to slide along this direction, right? Do you agree with that? Okay. And it is, right? We, if, unless you're told something different, you can assume that it's fully free to slide along that direction that the slot is cut. Okay. Well, if it's free to slide along that direction, then is any force going to be applied in that direction? No, it's free to slide, so there won't be any force applied in that direction, assuming it's a frictionless slot. So if, it's not got, if it doesn't have any force in that direction, does it have no force at all? No. Okay, it can have force. That pin is constrained to slide along that line, and the forces that constrain it as such would be forces perpendicular to that line that it is allowed to slide. Okay. So I'm going to show that as another line that I put right here and say that perpendicular line to the direction of the slot is the direction that forces might be applied at B. Now, some of you might have an, an intuition about what direction that force should be applied at B on this member. My guess is uh, if I forced all of you to respond, you know, either up and to the right or down and to the left, uh, made each one of you take a position on it, we would probably be about 50-50 in the room, and uh, no one would really be very confident. Okay? So I won't make you do that. What do you think that might mean? It might mean it's hard for anybody to look at it and tell what direction that force would go. Is that a problem? Not at all, because as long as I correctly identify the line of action, we can assume that the force will go either direction along that line of action. And uh, what happens is the final solution we get, the sign of that solution will tell us whether we were right or wrong. So what direction would you like to assume? Up and to the right. OK. Sounds good to me. OK. And I usually don't name this with a kind of the T uh, variable nomenclature, right? I don't usually use that because tension and compression don't have as much meaning for a connection like that. So a lot of times I'll just maybe use a variable like F sub B, meaning it's just the force being applied uh, at pin B. Okay? And that basically covers all of the forces that I would have applied to this body. And let me give me a little, give myself a little bit more room here. Is my free body diagram complete yet? Okay. What am I missing? Okay. So what I might want to do is uh, put some distances in here, right? Like how far it is from A to B. So that looks like it would end up being five meters, right? What else? OK, 
okay? Maybe three meters here, and one meter here, all right? And then someone just said slope, right? Slope of what? Okay, yeah, this direction of FB is not really fully defined yet, right? So what if I put in here rise and run for that force? How do I know rise and run for that force? Okay, yeah, some of you are looking at this member right here and saying, I know the rise and run of that member. It rises three for a run of what? Four, right? Horizontally, we go one plus three from E to B, right? So that's four horizontally and three vertically. So what do we do now given the fact that the force is actually on a line perpendicular to that line? You flip those, right? So we are going to, for the run, we're going to put in three. And for the rise, we're going to put in four. Okay? And I'm only missing one other thing, I think, on this diagram so far. Okay? Axes, someone says. Let me put this in as X, and I guess I'll just put this right here as Y. Okay. So, now at this point, um, I'm tempted to go ahead and... Um, start doing some uh, equilibrium equations. But I want to uh, serve you the best I can. Would you rather see equilibrium equations at this point, or would you rather draw the other free body diagram first? OK. I thought that might be a good idea, too. Draw the other free body diagram first. That way we get to see how they both interact with one another in terms of free body diagrams. Then we can go on and try to find the most efficient way to solve the problem. If you were solving this in real life, right, if this is, you were on a test, right, and what you were supposed to find was the force carried in pin B, for instance, would you go on and draw the other free body diagram at this point? Why not? Look carefully at the figure. What if I summed forces in the, in the uh, horizontal direction? I end up with just one variable, FB, right? So my point is I am going to draw that other free body diagram, but while we're here, I want to make the point that an efficient thing for me to do right now, if, if what I'm trying to find is the force in B, is to just go ahead and do my uh, horizontal sum of forces, okay? But in the interest of uh, showing you the whole thing, let me go and draw the other diagram. Okay, so there's my other member, uh, E, G, goes from E to G to B. Okay, what forces do I have acting on this diagram? Okay, I already know my reactions, right? I've got a downward force right here of 2.646 kilonewtons. I've got a rightward force acting right here of 5.291 kilonewtons. Okay. What else do I have at E? Okay. In order to be consistent, I have to apply Newton's third law and I had this tension from rope DE acting downward at D, that means that same tension acts upward at E. So I show a force pulling up, basically opposite direction of what I showed at D, and I name it TDE. Okay, and what do I show at G? Okay, another upward force that I'll call TCG. And this is me being consistent 
with how I am showing how these two bodies interact with one another. OK, now what do I show at B? All right, at B, I want to show a force that's labeled with the same type of label, right, FB, but going the opposite direction. OK. And what else should I put on here, you think? OK. Just to make sure we're clear about this slope, I should go ahead and label that on here as well. It will also have a rise of 4 and a run of 3. <laughs> OK. What else should I draw on this diagram? Distances. OK. So I like that idea. OK. So I've got one meter here, three meters here. OK. What else? OK. Oop, won't do that. OK. Let's do it over here. How far is it down to point E? OK, that's going to be 3 meters. <laughs> All right, so there are my two free body diagrams, I guess. You know, it wouldn't hurt for me to go ahead and put in axes here as well, something like this. Now what we want to do is try to take our most efficient solution path. All right, I already started talking about that a minute ago. But one of the things we can very quickly do on the left free body diagram is what? Find FB. So we may as well do that. OK, go ahead and sum. OK, and so uh, let me actually say for uh, body, and I'm, gonna, I'm being very carefully careful about saying this, for body A, B, C, D. I'm being careful about this so that you realize you can't do a equilibrium equation. Once you've split these apart, you're not doing an e equilibrium equation for the whole thing anymore. You have to pick a free body diagram you're doing that equation for. So I'm choosing A, B, C, D, and I'm going to do a sum of forces in the x direction. And there I've got 6 kilonewtons minus 2.739 kilonewtons times the sine of 15 degrees. Then what? Plus FB, but not the entire FB. I want just the horizontal component of FB. How do I get that? OK. 3 over the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared. What is the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared? Right? I kind of chose those numbers on purpose. OK. Good so far? Anything else? Anything else I'm missing on that body for that direction? Or am I good? OK. You guys, you know, you're the ones keep me honest here, so. We'll set that equal to 0, and we'll solve for FB. Okay, Looks to me like FB is going to end up becoming uh, 2.739 times the sine of 15 degrees minus 6, right?
Okay? I'm going to divide by 3 and multiply by 5. And that should give me negative 8.818. Okay, nice. So we found the force in pin B. What does the negative sign mean? All it means is that when we chose upward and to the right for the direction of FB acting on A, B, C, D, it's actually inverted from that. Okay, but we'll leave it alone. Now what do you want to do? Because what it, go back to what we were supposed to find up here. We're supposed to find the force carried in pin B. Hey, look at that. We got that done. What's next? Link CG. Okay. We need to find link CG as well as rope DE. Okay. Give me some suggestions. What can we do? to find either of those two. <laughs> Say what? <coughs> About D, okay. So the suggestion is, I think still for the left free body diagram, right? To, f to go ahead and sum moments for that free body diagram about point D. Okay. So what all will we have that will create moments around D? Okay, six kilonewtons times what? Five meters? Then what? Okay, so the reaction at A, we're going to have to split that into components, right? So um, it looks like, I guess we'll start with the horizontal direction, right? That'll create a clockwise tendency to rotate about D, 2.739 kilonewtons times what? To get the horizontal component, I need to take times the sine of 15 degrees and multiply that by 5 meters as well. And then what? get the vertical component as well, right? So minus 2.739 kilonewtons times the cosine of 15 degrees <coughs> times what? Four meters. All right, and that takes care of, I think, everything acting at joint A. Then what? Okay, put in joint B and if you look at FB, the horizontal component of FB will not create a tendency to rotate about D, right? So I don't need to worry about the horizontal component, only need to worry about the vertical component. The vertical component, at least the direction that it's shown here, the vertical component will cause a clockwise tendency to rotate, right? So I'm going to put in a minus because it's a clockwise tendency to rotate, but then remember the value of FB was actually minus 8.818 kilonewtons. Okay, but I don't want that entire value. I want just the vertical component. So what do I need to do? Multiply by 4 over 5. That gets me the vertical component. What do I need to multiply that by? 4 meters, someone said. Okay, am I done? Not quite, I have one more term I need to put in there and that's TCG, which looks like it'll try to rotate it counterclockwise about D at a length of one meter. And again, I'm counting on you guys to keep us honest here. 
Did I miss anything? Did I get everything? I think we got everything, okay? So let's go ahead and punch this in, all right? Um, actually, it ends up being pretty easy because the coefficient times TCG is one meter. Imagine moving everything else to the other side of the expression, okay? And that'll end up giving us a, something good to calculate, right? So I end up basically having minus six times five plus 2.739 times the sine of 15 degrees times five meters plus 2.739 times cosine of 15 times four, okay? Then what's my last one here? Okay. So I have to imagine moving this to the other side of the, of the equation, right? So I get rid of one of these minus signs, which leaves me with one minus sign, right? 8.818 uh, times 4 times 4 divided by 5. And because uh, I would basically divide all of that by 1 meter, I've got my answer just by hitting equals, at least if I didn't make any mistakes. Okay, winds up giving me negative 44.09 for TCG. Negative means what? Okay, I assumed tension came up with a negative number, it means that member's actually carrying a compressive force. Okay? Then what? Okay? We have one more equation that we can bring to bear on this, right? So we may as well do that. Our last equation that we've got would be a sum of forces in the y direction. Okay. So what are all my y components? <coughs> okay. I've got a positive 2.739 kilonewtons times the cosine of 15 degrees plus FB, right? But FB is a minus 8.818 kilonewtons. But I just want the vertical component of that, right, at B. So I multiply it by 4 over 5. Okay. Then what? Right. Minus the TCG I just found. What did I find for TCG? And then lastly, I still have my force acting at D. Okay. And that would be all of my force, force components in the y direction. All right, so I just need to execute that now. All right, so TDE will end up being 2.739 times the cosine of 15 uh, minus 8.818 times 4 over 5 plus 44.09. That ends up giving me 
All right. So now let's go through and see, do we, did we find everything we were supposed to? OK. We have the forces in link CG and rope DE and the force in pin B. So we're done. Yeah. Okay. He says he just wants to mention that it, the whole thing was a lot easier and nicer if we had done all of this work for member BGE. That could be. Okay. I won't deny it. Let me ask this. Is member BGE, is that free body diagram good for anything for us at this stage? Okay, it's an independent verification of the answers that you've come up with, right? If you plug in your uh, equilibrium equations, just plug in all the numbers, they should all sum to zero, right? And that can be an independent check. Did I see a hand over here? Over there. Question is, is there a way before you start this to be able to pick a free body diagram and decide maybe that's easier to use than another one? Um, you know, the answer to that is yes, but it'd be difficult for me to tell you what the uh, criteria would be that you should look for beyond this, okay? Always what you're looking for, regardless of what you're doing, you're always looking for ways to eliminate variables that would show up in equations, right? If you can eliminate more variables from a, an equation that you write, the math is going to be easier, right? And so probably what you may have seen on this one that would help you, you know, it might convince you to do the right free body diagram instead of the left free body diagram. You might look at uh, pin E down there and realize that if you sum moments around E after having found FB, right? So uh, actually I'll start at the beginning, right? Just like on the left free body diagram, you could sum forces in the x direction and find FB. Okay? That makes sense? So that would not be much different. But the next step where you summed moments, you could do it about location E, right? And you'd end up with a much simpler equation than our moment equation we had to write. And the reason why is you've got a lot of forces with lines of action that pass through E. So it eliminates all those from having to be in the equation. So that's always what you look for. You say, you know, can I eliminate a lot of variables or even, you know, it can even make your math simpler to eliminate things that aren't variables, right? Eliminate forces, even if you know them, it still eliminates a term from your sum. Okay? Okay, his question is, um, if he figures out a, a reason why finding one thing is easy in one free body diagram and then finding another thing is easy in the other free body diagram, as long as you know what he found in the first free body diagram, it, does that pose a problem to bring that answer over to the other free body diagram and proceed? And the answer to that question is absolutely not. It is completely fine to do that, right? As a matter of fact, that's sometimes what is you know, that most efficient path through the solution. Okay. Good questions. Any other questions on this example? Yeah. Okay. I think the question is, we assumed FB on this problem was in one direction on one free body diagram. Um, and the question is, would we need to change the sign when we find it on the other free body diagram? No, the sign tells you whether or not your assumption was right, right? But the assumption we made of upward and to the right at B on the left free body diagram is already consistent with downward and to the left at B on the other free body diagram. Those two are saying the same thing. That's the same assumption, right? So 
The only thing that the, the positive or negative answer tells us is whether or not that assumption was correct. Does that make sense? All right. Any other questions on this problem? Or shall we go to another example problem? Let's do another one. All right, second example problem. In this case, very simply, what it wants us to find is the resultant force carried in pin B. Okay? Easy, right? What's different about this problem? Okay. Someone says there's no two force members. You could maybe count the rope as a two force member. Okay. But he's right. ABC is not a two force member, nor is BDE a two force member. Right? They're connect they got too many connections on them for them to be two force members. Too many forces. Okay? How many reaction components do I have? I've got four reaction components. What do you think that might clue us into about our solution procedure? Okay. Someone's over here says, we cannot start by finding external reactions first. Right? And I would agree with that. You don't want to start this problem by finding external reactions first. Okay. There is one other feature on this problem that I'll just mention right now that uh, is one of the reasons I chose to do this, and that is how do you deal with a pulley that is a non-trivial size? Right? Sometimes you can deal with pulleys and they end up being quote unquote small relative to the size of everything else. Sometimes though, you, you don't see that and you end up with a pulley that is not small right, relative to the other sizes. So that's another thing that will pop up with this problem. Okay, so we're not finding external reactions first, but we do have this interesting uh, member that is the pulley applied at C. Okay, and so that's actually where I'm going to start this analysis is with that pulley at pin C. Fair enough? Let's look at that pulley. I'm going to do, I'm going to you know, have us think about a free body diagram of that pulley, okay? And to make a nice, neat circle, right? I'm going to use my little circle tool here. Here, Boy, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. So what forces do you feel like might be applied to this pulley that are easy for us to identify? Okay. We have a 50 pound force that kind of comes off over here somewhere, right? And we can do a little better than that too, right? We can say what angle that's coming off because that was given to us. Okay. What else? Okay. Is there another spot that the rope comes off the pulley? Okay. So we have to get that one too. What's the magnitude of that force? Assuming it's a frictionless pulley, which we assume as long as we're not told anything else, this is also going to be 50 pounds. Because the tension in the rope doesn't change as it passes over the frictionless pulley. Okay. Now, if that's all we had acting on that pulley, it would accelerate. And this is a statics class, right? So we don't want that happening. And we're saying, no, it doesn't accelerate. And why? Okay. There's some reactions at the pin. Now, up till now, every time we've seen a pin, we've basically known what to do with it, right? It doesn't allow motion left and right. 
correct? It doesn't allow motion up and down. So one thing I could do at this pin is I could draw reactions like this, for instance. And I could call them, you know, maybe CX and CY. And this isn't wrong. You can do this. But what do you have to do once you've identified those two reactions? Okay. You get some forces in the X and the Y. If you took a moment around uh, pin C, what would you find? The 50 pounds turning it clockwise would exactly balance the 50 pounds turning it counterclockwise. So the moment equation is not super interesting, right? Because it's you can tell it's going to be balanced that way, right? But CX and CY, you would have to do some of forces in the X and some of forces in the Y to figure out what CX and CY actually were. Do you want me to show you an easier way? I very seldom have people answer no to that question. Okay. All right. I can imagine forces, I can put a combination of any kind of forces on that pin to balance these two 50 pound forces that I put on there. And as long as they do balance them, then that body ends up in equilibrium, right? So what if I do it in an alternative way instead of CX and CY like I showed a second ago? What if I show one that is a force acting parallel with the 50 pound force down here and another force acting parallel with this 50 pound force over here? Okay. And let me go a little bit further and say, just what if I, I made this one 50 pounds and this one 50 pounds? So my first question after doing that is, does it look like this body would be balanced translationally? In other words, is it going to accelerate vertically or horizontally, like in a translational way? Why not? Yeah, every bit of vertical force I've got is balanced by something that, it, by symmetry, you can tell is balancing it in the opposite direction. Okay, so translationally, I know that this diagram is balanced. What about rotationally? Okay, let me show you this. I've got the radius of the pulley right here, correct? Do I also have the radius of the pulley right here? And so this, you know, this pair right here, this 50 pounds and this 50 pounds, is going to create a, a rotational effect in the counterclockwise direction based on that length r. And this pair, this 50 pounds and this 50 pounds, will create the same rotational effect but in the opposite direction. So it still balances rotationally. So my point with this is, you know, not even with doing any math, but basically by inspection, I'm showing you that, that those two forces that I apply on there, the 50 pounds and the 50 pounds, acting at the pin on the pulley, balance the 50 pounds and the 50 pounds pulling on the outer circumference of the pulley. Why is this helpful, you think? Okay. We figured out the forces in the pin, and so by Newton's third law, what can I do on my original figure? You guys are going to love this. Okay. On the original figure, I erase all of that mess, right? And if I say that the pin at C applies an upward force of 50 pounds to the pulley, what does that mean the pulley applies to point C on the frame? Okay. 
And what else? Okay, so I just, I just accounted for this guy right here, right? What do I need to do with this guy right here? Equal and opposite again, right? And what you're going to see here, basically what I did was I took these two forces that originally looked like they were applied out on the outer circumference of the pulley, and I basically moved them to the pin at C, right? And I can be a little more specific too, because I know that this one, even though it may not look like 30 degrees anymore, that's 30 degrees still. Okay? And I'm almost done, right, simplifying my uh, location where the pulley was applied. I have to do one more thing, though, and what's that? Okay? Yeah, the force that is applied at D. So I'm going to take all that off of there and say I've got an upward force acting right here of 50 pounds. Now, does that look easier to solve? If it doesn't, it should. All right, good deal. So there is a big chunk of the problem, and we said a second ago we don't have to find external reactions first. So what's our next step? Let me get this guy out of the way. I might also erase some of my uh, notational gesticulations here. All right, what's next? I don't find external reactions, so I go to drawing free body diagrams of the non-two force members which is everything that's left, right? So I've got this member right here. Try that again, make it a little bit straighter. And then let's do this one over here. All right, so what forces do I need to identify on A, B, C? What at A? Okay. And I'm not going to try to think about these in, you know, too close a terms. Let me just call this R, A, make sure I don't reverse them here, R, A, Y, and R, A, X. Now, what at B? This is where a lot of people make a mistake. Okay, let me ask you this. Would it be appropriate for me to do this? If you're taking notes, don't write that yet. Okay. Why is that a bad thing for me to do? You do that when you know you've got a two force member. When you have a two-force member, it means you know the line of action of the force. Extends from pin to pin, right? What if you don't have a two-force member? You don't do this, okay? So this is where a lot of people make their first mistake on a problem like this. We don't know anything about magnitude of the force at B nor direction of the force at B at this point. I can't inspect it and tell what direction the force acts at B. So if I don't know magnitude or direction of the force acting at B, then the best thing for me to do is to just to put two components at B. And again, I'm not going to be too careful uh, to try to pick any particular direction. I'm just going to show uh, a vertical and a horizontal component at B, and I'll call this one BY, and I'll call this one BX. Okay, 
Now, what else do I need on here? <coughs> At C, but we already figured out what those were, so I just need to copy them on here, right? 50 pounds down and 50 pounds at this 30 degree angle. Okay, now before I move on to my other free body diagram, let's do a quick little inventory here. Is there anything I can find just based on the left free body diagram as it stands right now? I got too many things I don't know on that diagram. Nothing looks like it's easy for me to just pick off and find real quick. Okay. So we don't fret. We just say, okay, we did our best with that free body diagram. Um, we probably should finish it out. What else do I need on there? Okay. Some lengths, right? So this will be nine inches. This will be six inches, whether or not it looks like it. Okay. What else? Okay. Three inches here and two inches up to the top. Okay, and additionally, I'm going to put uh, some coordinates on here. Let me just do it this way. I'll show this as X, and I'll show this as Y. Okay, now what should I put on my other free body diagram? So I already drew the body, right? It's over here. Okay. Remember, we have to be consistent from one free body diagram to the other. So we have to pay particular attention to any spots where there's an interaction between the two bodies. So you might want to start with B to make sure you're careful with it, right? And what do we need to do with B? Like BY, for instance, does it go up or down? Down. Okay, BX should go to the left. And that is being consistent from one diagram to the other according to Newton's third law. Okay. You've also got an upward uh, 50 pounds. Okay. And we have two reaction forces at E. Okay, what else should I add on this figure? Some dimensions, so I'll go ahead and do that. So this right here is going to be six inches, looks like. Okay, and how far is it from top down? Okay, looks like that'll be four inches. Okay, and I've, I probably want to think about at least one other dimension. And uh, I kind of lost it while I did some erasing just a second ago. But I made a comment, or I had up there a note that said that that rope that attached at D was vertical. I also, a little bit of it remains right here. What was that, four inches? That was the diameter of that pulley. So my point with this, I, I mentioned right at the beginning, the, uh, one of the points of doing this problem is to show you that sometimes the diameter of the pulley matters if what it does, if one of the things it does is locate a particular spot that the rope will ultimately connect. Okay? So let me go ahead and say here that radius value is going to be 2 inches because the diameter of the pulley was 4 inches. So let me put that right here. That's also going to be this value, right? Two inches 
from the 50 pounds over to point E horizontally. And the good news is that's actually the only value that matters to me with respect to that 50 pounds because that's what's going to be uh, useful for me to be able to find uh, things like moments. Okay. Is everyone feeling good? Why are you feeling good? I mean, I want you to feel good. I want you to tell me, though, you know, give me a witness. Why are you feeling so good? Because, because this example problem's almost over. We only have about five minutes left in class. He better finish, right? I don't see how we're going to get this done so fast. Okay, he says, can you treat B as one force and do a sum of moments around something? The problem with that is you don't know magnitude or direction of the force at B. Right? Okay, let me show you why I'm not sad. I'm, I am happy. Okay, let me show you why that's the case. You can use combinations of equations from the two, right? You can mix and match because the two, the two diagrams are consistent with one another, right? Now let's think about what it is we want to find versus things that we don't care about finding. What did the instructions say at the beginning? Yeah, we want to know the resultant force carried in pin B. Do we care what the reaction is at A? Do we care what the reaction is at E? So how many things do we need to find to find what we're trying to find? Only two things. So if we can find two equations out of these two diagrams that include BX and BY, then that would be something we could solve and figure out BX and BY without having to find anything else. So we need two equations that would eliminate RAX, RAY, REX, and REY. How would we go about doing that? So I think what you guys are saying is you take the left free body diagram over here, right? You take for body uh, ABC, right? And you do a sum of moments around A. Okay. So for this, I'm going to have BX okay, times 3 inches, and should that be positive or negative? Clockwise? Negative. BY is going to be clockwise, right? So plus BY times what? 9 inches, and then what? Minus 50 pounds times what? 15 inches? Okay, that's taking care of the, uh, the vertical piece one right there. Then what? Minus 50 pounds times the cosine of 30 degrees. Okay, times what? Times 5 inches. Then what? Minus 50 pounds. Tell you what, I'm going to go to the next line here. Minus 50 pounds times the sine, 30 degrees, times 15 inches. Equals zero. OK. Now, let me sum. This is this next one I'm going to do is for body, what is that body? BDE. Okay, we're going to sum moments around location E. Okay, and as I do that, I will have minus, well actually let me start with uh, X and Y. So BX, clockwise or counterclockwise for BX? 
Okay, so I'll take positive BX times 4 inches. Then what? Times 6 inches. Then what? Minus 50 pounds times 2 inches equals 0. Right? So what do I do with that? Plug it in our handy dandy calculator. In the equation solver, we'll put in minus 3 equals 9 equals, okay? Over here, we need to move all that stuff to the other side of the equation, right? So I'm going to put in 50 times 15 plus 50 times the cosine of 30 uh, times 5 plus 50 times the sine of 30 times 15. Okay, that's it for my first equation. Second equation, I put in 4. 6, and remember I got to move this one to the other side of the equation too, so I put in positive 50 times 2. And that gives me a BX value of negative 132.34. Uh, okay, units, pounds, negative means what? means we assumed it would act right, rightward on the left free body diagram. It's really switched from that. We don't really care, though, for what we're trying to answer, right? By, we were correct that direction, 104.93. Okay. Was this what we were asked for? Okay. I would say maybe FB, right, is going to be equal to the square root of minus 132.34 pounds squared plus 104.93 pounds squared. And when we put that stuff in, we're going to have, let's see, 132.34 squared plus 104.93 squared, 168.89 pounds is the resultant force acting on pin B, okay? Was that cool? Okay, I'm glad that was cool. By the way, that's the number that you would want to use if you wanted to figure out something like, will that pin shear? Right? You'd want to use a number like that along with what? The cross-sectional area of the, of the pin and maybe the strength of the pin. All right. I know you guys want to go. I will see you next time.